Jargon is like riding a bike in that once you learn it, you kind of forget how hard it was to learn. Jargon is one of the ways that people signal that they're part of a community and that they understand what they're talking about. It's very important to know and understand when it's appropriate to use jargon and when it's not. Who is your audience, right? That's the basic question of all writing. Who's reading this? Why are they reading it? If it's a beginner who needs to be brought into a community that uses jargon. If you avoid the jargon, you're not doing them any favors because it's going to take them longer to be able to read things that aren't written for beginners. So what you need to do is use the jargon and then define it in context. Not in some glossary that nobody's ever going to refer to, but right there in the sentence. I would say whoever has the, the deepest focus on the user should be the gate. Mm -hmm. Whether that's your product manager, whether that's your lead, whether it's the, you know, your head of DevRel, who, whoever is the person that has the most laser-like focus on the user should have the final say about what gets prioritized on the wish list. Because if it's not serving the user, what is it for? Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Today, our guest is Erin McKean. You may realize that you have read uh, her writings before and... Uh, now you might be connecting the dots. We just were, uh, before the recording started, we were talking about context overlap. And it's kind of funny because this also happened to me, Erin, when I was listening to your presentation at Writer Docs in um, 2018, I think, in Portland. I realized that Address a Day, that's your blog. <laughs> they were talking about documentation and dictionaries. And it, uh, it was a very funny context overlap. Um, then, as far as I remember, you were um, talking as part of IBM's DevRel team. Since then, you joined uh, Google's open source office, and you are a documentation advocate. And you are involved in many, many other projects, inspiring <laughs> people across many contexts to write and to create. How do you find the time for all of this? <laughs> luck. Luck goes a lot into it. I feel like I'm pretty lucky to like be in reasonably good health and, you know, not to have uh, many, many small children. They're terrible time sucks, small children. But also I have this philosophy that I stole from an American writer named Robert Benchley that you're able to do any amount of work as long as it's not the work you're supposed to be doing at the time. So true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel like if I have a lot of projects going, then whenever I'm bored or stuck or like waiting on somebody else for one project, I can switch to something else. And especially like being stuck working from home, I feel like it's slowed down a lot of things and sped up a lot of other things. So sometimes I'm waiting to hear back from somebody uh -huh. and it's always nice to have like four different things that I can be looking at. Yeah. I need to put a note here, like, I must knit. <laughs> and hopefully that will work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been like, uh, I'm not really a bullet journal person, but I did steal one idea from the bullet journalers, which is to like have little boxes that you fill in when you've done something. Uh -huh. And for some reason, having a little box to color in is so much more satisfying than like making a little tick mark or drawing a line through something. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying really hard to like have certain things that I do every day so that I can fill in the box. Color the tick box challenge. Yes, with really nice pens, of course. And what are current the projects you push your to do list to make time for docs or otherwise, or in other words, um, what skills have you been picking up recently? <laughs> oh, so I realized pretty early on in like work from home time that if I didn't do some stretching or exercise or especially yoga every day that mm -hmm. by like four or five o'clock I was just this parody of like a bent over old lady hobbling around so now every day without fail yoga and I've also been trying to write fiction every day like fiction? even just 200 words yeah because I just realized it's been about a decade since my novel came out and I was like, huh, maybe I should write Time to another write one. The next <laughs> Can you share um, some details? 
Oh, I'm not, I'm not a very great writer. Like I'm a very like middling writer. So I really am interested in stories about people and work, which I think is, I, I find stories about people and work fascinating. Like the and, secret life of working people or? <laughs> like more like how do people decide what they want to do? How mm -hmm. do people find like their life and how work fits into their life? And I, I kind of like seeing that through like the lens of the, of like women's fiction and, you know, what's sometimes called chick lit, because mm -hmm. so much of that is about, okay, well, how do you find your life through your relationships? Hmm. But like your relationship to your work is like a key relationship in your life. Most recently, you are involved in the Good Dogs project. Can you tell us about it? How did it start? And who is the doctor this? a program where we connect open source projects with technical writers to try to get more and better documentation in open source. Because all the research we have shows that people make their decisions about whether to use open source, what open source to use, based on the availability or lack of availability of documentation. So if, you, if your project has good docs, it has a huge advantage. And so Cameron was um, working with uh, the OSGEO project and was talking with other projects. And they, they realized that we're all trying to write kind of the same kinds of docs. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have some templates. And we we're mm -hmm. like, well, this is a great idea. And so he reached out um, to some other folks at Google who pulled me in. And the project is going, uh, it's really making some progress. It's also participating in this year's season of Docs with some uh, uh, working on an information architecture template, like awesome. really exciting. Yes. And um, yeah, so the Good Docs project, the goal is to create useful documentation for people who may not necessarily be professional technical writers, but who have open source projects that need documentation. So the focus is on making it very clear what you need to do. So if you're a busy developer and you're just like, oh, I'm so glad I'm finished with my project. And then you're like, oh, wait, I need docs. <laughs> that you can start looking and get a workable set of documentation that you can then refine. And the Doctopus is the mascot of the Good Docs project. We had thought about making a Templatopus, but it didn't really, it, it's not as easy to illustrate as the Doctopus. And the great thing, my favorite thing about the octopus, is that um, it's modifiable. So if your project has a choose logo, the arm or... <laughs> yeah, you can choose what the arms hold. And so you could have the, your octopus hold like a little docs icon. And you could also have it hold the icon for your project. So you could have a customized octopus that you could then turn into sticker form that you could send to your docs contributors. <laughs> Because, you know, it's all about the swag. Do you have uh, any plans to, to turn uh, the Good Docs project into a sticker company? Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, every project I touch turns into a sticker project at some point. But I have a lot of Doctopus stickers that I'm hoping to be able to send out to people. And the, the files, the files for the Doctopus so that you can customize your own are on GitHub. Like it's a GitHub, the GitHub repo is the Good Docs project. And um, one of the things that the Good Docs project is working on that I'm very excited about is that we're going to have a sample project using the template. And it's an extremely fake project so that we don't like step on any real project's toes. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's, um, it's called Chronolog. And it's a, um, it's a project that helps you uh, translate between different calendars for your time machine. Okay. Yeah. How is that a fake? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have a time machine, I would really like to borrow it. Um, there's I some things I'd like to idea. change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if somebody would like to contribute, and then how can they? Like the, the information architecture, that sounds super interesting because that suddenly opens the doors to the people who are not necessarily technical writers, but have yes. a lot to say. I One of the things that I've enjoyed the most about 
the people like working with the people who are working with the good docs project is that there are a lot of very talented highly experienced technical writers involved in the project but there are also people who have come to it because they really love tooling Mm -hmm. and there are people who've come to it because they're interested in being consumers of the documentation templates because they're project managers and they are running projects that need this and so you can just show up at the github repo there's a wiki you can see what our weekly meetings are like anybody's welcome to join we actually have two meetings, one in a kind of U.S. friendly time zone and one in an Australia friendly time zone. Although I have to say, like, I feel a lot of empathy for the people I work with in Australia because there really doesn't seem to be an Australia friendly time zone. Um, if you're trying to work with people in the U.S. or in Europe, you're just kind of That's always got the short end. You need the vampires. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of early morning people and late night people on those calls. Um, yeah. There's open issues. There's lots of stuff for people to pick up. Just showing up and seeing like what people are talking about. When I first heard about the Good Dogs Project and what it stands for, I was immediately thinking about fellow startups in a business accelerator. And I was like, I, sh- I should send them there. But oops, they're not open source. Oh, the Good Dogs Project is open source, but the businesses aren't. But, you know, the Good Dogs Project is working under a very... Um, permissive licenses. So I think a lot of it's zero BSD. Some of it might be CC by. Mm-hmm. So it's totally possible to use these templates for closed source purposes. So if I know other people so, who could really use some ideas of how should this look like, what the programmers want to see, how, how, how do we see documentation to be and, and show some templates, I, I can send them there, even if their project itself isn't an open source project. Yes, our target our target audience is open source projects, but mm-hmm. most closed source projects have a very similar shape, right? Mm-hmm. Like yes. you have users, they need to know basic concepts, they need to be able to install the thing, they need some quick start rules or some reference material, like you know the classic four types of documentation. Yeah, but the licensing is very permissive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, then I will share that because I was afraid of sharing that in other channels. <laughs> However much uh, we are also talking a lot about templates and checklists. If nothing yeah. else, start bullet journaling your project like hell. But <laughs> maybe also <laughs> temps. Um, and I didn't say that in the intro, but you have a second life as the founder of Wordnik, uh, which yes. is the largest dictionary by some measures in the world. And I'm sure uh, that you have taken up a lot of experience there as, as someone who runs a project. Does that experience inform some of the decisions behind the Good Dogs project? So it's interesting because I feel like <laughs> my, my weakness is a superpower in terms of documentation because I, I do like 99.99% of the software development and the ops of WordMic, but I am not trained as a computer scientist and almost everything I've learned, I've learned from other people's documentation, which means that I have a lot of empathy for the mediocre developer who needs to be able to build something and who doesn't have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that I'm always pushing to think of that person. Like, you know, sometimes we get pushed back on documentation for people who are like, you should just read the code. I was like, nobody's got time for that. Like it takes five times as long to read the code as it does to read good documentation. And the documentation should be written so that somebody who's really stressed, who's something that's broken, who has a limited background and maybe incomplete context can actually do the thing. If you plan for the worst case scenario, the best case scenario just kind of comes by itself. Yeah, that's easy. So why do you think it's a weakness then? So like, I'm not a great developer. And so my weakness makes me rely more on documentation on tutorials, on examples, because I need all that extra support. If I were a fantastic, like, you know, 
mythical 10x rock star developer yeah sure i could do all this in my sleep i could do all this you know one-handed but i can't but, but that swagger would never have been born so this is a superpower <laughs> And funnily enough, the thing that I consider myself strongest at is actually a weakness of documentation. Like, I know a lot of words, but I often don't know whether the words that I think are completely normal and ordinary and like everybody understands are difficult for people for whom English is not their first language. Like, mm. this is the Emmy McKinley will come yes. to them. Like, are you below the 10,000 words vocabulary here? Yeah, and I, and I always push back against people who are like, don't use jargon, don't use, you know, don't use unusual words. I was like, how do you expect people to learn the jargon if you don't use it? It's like, it's like, you know, if you're teaching people how to ride a bike, it's okay to give them training wheels. Like, you don't want to just shove them on top of a bike and let them fall over a thousand times until they're all beat up. Mm -hmm. And jargon is like riding a bike in that once you learn it, you kind of forget how hard it was to learn. So we should avoid using jargon. Jargon is one of the ways that people signal that they're part of a community and that they understand what they're talking about. Like, for example, doctors use use very specific medical terminology for two reasons. One is for precision, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if you say uvula, right? The other doctors understand that you mean that little dangly thing in the back of your throat. Maybe not everybody in the world who speaks English knows what the uvula is or could point to it, you know, on a diagram. The other reason that they use it is so that other doctors know that they know what the heck they're talking about. Like, if your doctor was giving a talk at a conference and said, you know, well, today we're going to talk about diseases of the dangly little thing at the back of your throat. You'd be like, who is this bozo? Why doesn't he use the right language? Why and so it's very important to, to know and understand when it's appropriate to use jargon and when it's not. Who is your audience, right? That's the basic question of all writing. Who's reading this? Why are they reading it? If it's a beginner who needs to be brought into a community that uses jargon. If you avoid the jargon, you're not doing them any favors because it's going to take them longer to be able to read things that aren't written for beginners. So what you need That's to true. do is use the jargon and then define it in context, not in some glossary that nobody's ever going to refer to, but <laughs> right there in the sentence, right? You know, there's all sorts of things that you can talk about. And, and we do this constantly. Most of the words people learn in their lifetime, they learn from context. If you have a typical working vocabulary of, you know, tens of thousands of words, have you looked up things in a dictionary tens of thousands of times? Even as a dictionary editor, like, I think that's ridiculous. You learn from rich context, and it's our jobs as technical communicators to make sure the context is rich enough for people to learn. Sorry, that is like my total rant thing. Like, you know, words are created for a reason, and that reason is not to mess with people most of the time. That reason is to, like have a level of precision of communication or to bring people together a community of communication like slang does that people who share slang they share a community certainly they could say everything that they want flat basic boring general terms but the slang is what brings them together and jargon is the same thing so people people who say that we shouldn't use jargon that we shouldn't use technical terms that we should flatten everything down to the most bland language that we can, they're like saying, hey, I'm gonna give you three crayons. Go ahead, make your picture, right? You can have yellow, you can have green, you can have purple, done. We can, we're not gonna get great, we're not gonna get as much variety. We're not going to reach as many people as we could if we don't use all the tools that we've got. So yeah, I can rant about that for several more hours. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> we're holding back, you know. I think I'm just gonna surrender that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it. You have to you have to give people the tools that they need to understand fully the domain that they're trying to understand. And if you prevent them from le learning the specialized vocabulary of that domain, you've just like slowed down their learning process. 
Yeah. There's a special temptation though, like when you're writing technical explanation and you know, you're using jargon, but you're doing that purposefully so that mm -hmm. it's real. Yeah. And it is a special temptation to put the explanation in brackets in a certain, kind of a snappy way. I, I sometimes catch myself doing that. Like, you know, also known as if you have never been, like if you've been living <laughs> under a rock for the last 10 years, that's what it means. And, and that's, you, you have to like limp yourself to avoid that snappiness. But um, it's good to be one foot on each side. Kind of I think that. I think that if you don't already like take joy in explaining things to people as a technical writer, you have to like work hard to develop that joy. Because if, if you think of explaining something, even the most basic things as like a tedious chore that you have to get through before you can get to the real work, then you're never going to get to the real work because everything's always going to be a tedious chore. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite thing is when somebody tells me, I don't know what that is because then I get to explain things at length, which I love doing. And then, <laughs> but also I get to, they're, they're giving me the gift of their ignorance, right? If I don't know what, how you don't know something, I'm not going to be able to explain everything that depends on that piece of knowledge to you. And so I try really hard to be as approachable as possible to be like, I'm fascinated by what people don't know, not in a ha ha, you didn't know that way, but in like, no, they trust you. What with is that. your mental landscape like? Where are the gaps? How can mm -hmm. we work together to fill them? One on one, that's kind of easier, but <sighs> yeah. when you're writing to the unknown, your user is not you, it gets a little, a little more. <clears throat> well, you have to plan that. Yeah. With templates and, I... and checklists. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely try to default to just assuming that the person that I'm writing for is good natured and curious. Because first of all, why would I waste my time writing for jerks, right? If I think somebody's going to be reading what I'm written with like a, a gotcha, with gotcha goggles on, like, ah, I'm going to find out what's wrong with this. But I'm like, I don't care about you, <laughs> you know? Sure. I'm always happy to learn where I'm wrong, but if you're doing it in a gotcha way, then you're not my target audience. We already talked about templates and checklists, <laughs> but let's add the third one, wish list. So let's talk about a bit. What would it typically contain in the case of a new API, for example, and who creates this wish list for whom and why? Wish list. I feel like I have so many of my projects have wish lists of documentation that I want to create and there's never enough time okay, and I'm like always behind. It's like a backlog and I think probably calling it a backlog makes it seem more official just as like what you're sending to Santa Claus. But mm -hmm. like a backlog should someday hopefully get made. <laughs> but I feel like the people who have the most contact with the user should be like their voices should be heard the most in creating a backlog. Like if, if you, if you're lucky enough to have customer support or people monitoring Slack stack overflow or chat groups or, you know, discord or wherever your users are. And they're adding things to the backlog because they noticed users or customers having trouble with particular things that should carry a lot more weight than someone saying, oh, hey, to check all the boxes, we should have this piece of documentation. And when and does this wish list come up? Like the SME saying, I have two hours bench time, show me a wish list. Or uh, the, the writer team having a weekly two hours of, hey, customer support, where's the wish list? Or how, how does this come up? I think however it works for you. Like I, like most, a lot of what I work on, I'm working like by myself or on very small teams. So my wish list gets looked at when I just can't bear to look at any of the other things on my to-do list. But I think for bigger teams, making it part of your cadence of work and mm -hmm. having labels. So, hey, you know, if we really need a code sample and it's just the devs who can make it, make sure that that's labeled so they don't wade through a bunch of stuff that's like, oh, we need to like we've decided to change the hyphenization of this term and we need to go back and check all of our docs to, to 
go with the new hyphenization, that's not something that you should have your devs even think about looking at. Because they're going to go down through a huge rabbit hole making a new linter for that. And that will just distract them from things that you probably want them to do more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So using labels and also having a wish list, like the, the filter that you have to use when looking at your wish list is you always have to be thinking about who is our target user? Mm -hmm. Who are the people that we really, really need to reach? Because there could be a lot of like off label uses for your tool or project or, or product that, make it onto the wish list, but they're not your core user. Uh, who curates that wish list then? Whoever has the, I would say whoever has the, the deepest focus on the user should be the gate. Mm -hmm. Whether that's your product manager, whether that's your lead, whether it's the, you know, your head of DevRel, who, whoever is the person that has the most laser-like focus on the user should have the final say about what gets prioritized on the wish list. Because if it's not serving the user, what is it for? If it's not serving the user, then it's just somebody's ego project. That is the, that is the backlog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where would you keep that? Is this, uh, is this in Redmine? Where is I this? keep a lot of my backlog slash wish list items in Trello, but mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of like organizing your desk, right? You want to have it someplace where you won't forget about it, but you don't want to be tripping over it every day. You don't want to have to move it to the side so that you can get your real work done, which is why I think having it wherever you keep your backlog or wherever you have your like, hey, this is something that we look at regularly, but it's not always try to grab for your attention. Like, don't set it up with reminders that ping you every day. That's insanity. But, like, have it be a consistent agenda item of something that you were reviewing. A week before. Like, one week thing that we started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that we started in the Good Docs project that I love is that in every meeting, the last item on the agenda is what is the oldest open issue or pull request. And does so it spark real, still like, joy? <laughs> Well, it is a comparatively young project. So we're talking about like months, not years. <laughs> so um, you have a wish list there then at the Good Docs project. Yeah. And I think most of the wish list is in is captured in issues right now. And like, hey, this would be nice to work on. Mm -hmm. I think that it can be so easy to get bogged down in like, what do we have to do today? What do we have to do to make the launch date? What do we, you know, what do we have a customer waiting on us for? that you don't give yourself time to pull back and say, what do we want to be? Right? What, what's really the like destiny of this project? When is it going to be everything that it wants to be when it grows up? And keeping a wish list is, is a way to kind of keep that, that future focus going. Hmm. That's an interesting way of looking at it. So that's a wish list for yourself. And then when you're the tech writer who's trying to motivate non-tech writer SMEs to help you write what your users need, and then you write a wish list, that's when you start tagging, like, I would like a dev center here. And uh, <laughs> are you ex center there? I feel like it's very hard for technical writers to create this kind of change in an organization that doesn't reward technical writing. Like, that's the first thing that has to happen. Like, you can be pushing that boulder from the bottom up the hill all you want. But if we're to the top of the hill, nobody recognizes that work, then it's just going to roll back down to the bottom again, and you're going to be very sad. Like, Is it about creating a culture? Yes. <laughs> like, if you don't have a culture that values docs, if you can't, if, if everybody in the org can't say with a straight face and doesn't believe, mm -hmm that docs drive adoption, docs drive community, docs drive user satisfaction, whatever metric you care about, if you, as a company, as an organization, as a project, if you can't draw a straight line between docs and that outcome, that's the first thing you have to solve for. You have to get everybody on the same page to realize that it's important. And some of the things that, that like motivate devs can be like, hey, you just spent a ton of time working on this feature. Nobody is gonna use it if there's no docs. Most of the devs I've met, they hate building things that people don't use. And 
so a lot of the like docs advocacy work that I focus on is how do we build that culture? How do we make sure that everybody understands that every survey on this topic says, you know, shows that devs care about good documentation much more than they care about other things that we might think are more important, like shaving two milliseconds off your API response time. Doesn't matter if they're not using the API in the first place. So talking about creating a culture, what does it mean on a practical level or what are the necessary steps to make? People have to get rewarded mm -hmm. across the org for having good docs so that when people are putting in their objectives and key results, when they're being evaluated for promotion, when they're being evaluated for bonuses, there has to be a called out on paper line item checkbox saying this is what we need in the way of documentation here are the measurable <laughs> measurable things that you have to reach not just hey have some docs but like what mm -hmm. kind of docs how much docs how do we know if they're going to work or not and if people are not rewarded for doing something they very rarely do it <laughs> so and pats on the back are often not reward enough if there are too many other competing priorities. I know it sounds harsh, but like you gotta pay people. <laughs> Even in open source, you have to pay them with recognition and with acknowledging their work. So I know it's kind of hard because oftentimes the people who are closest to seeing the value of docs are people who don't have as much power in the org as we would hope, but sharing the research, sharing how docs drive adoption can, can say, Hey, look, you know, technical writers by and large are less expensive than software developers. If we added two technical writers and could get this much more in terms of adoption, wouldn't you think that that was a good return on your investment? So it's, it's a lot of work. I, I don't think that I'm going to run out of stuff to like rant about in the next couple of decades. <laughs> <laughs> I think treating documentation as a product feature and not an add-on, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the functionality. It's not the box. Not that anybody buys software in a box anymore, but you know, mm -hmm. like, so let's say that it, the, the old mindset and one that I am totally guilty of as well is that, oh, our API has to have these endpoints because these are the use cases that our customers say that they want, right? Mm -hmm. We just have to assume that every customer has an implicit unspoken use case of, I want documentation. And we need to make that explicit as well, because I think customers assume that there are going to be docs, yeah. but maybe the project manager doesn't assume that there are going to be docs. The customer assumes that the thing's going to work, which implies testing, but did the project manager budget for that as a feature, like as an, like as a key core feature, just the same as blog on is a feature of your website. If it's not budgeted as a feature, then it's easy to say, okay, well, it's a fringe thing. But we've seen from like, you know, the same companies that get mentioned over and over again and who are leaders, straight mm -hmm. Twilio. Mm -hmm. MailChimp just did a big revamp of its um, transactional email API where documentation was like front and center in the revamp. And like, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's a feature. And the products that have that feature stack up better than the projects that don't. Look, I, I was just doing like a big trawl through some... Um, through some node modules and there's so many node modules for every single dumb thing you could ever want to do in JavaScript, right? That it's easy to just close the tab. If there's no readme, why am I even going to waste my time? Mm -hmm. I don't even consider it as an option. If there's no readme. Well, usually we talk about it in a way of, if, there is not the intention and the execution of investing in a readme, then we don't trust the creators to maintain this. 
I think one of the best things we could do as documentarians is to get a bunch of high profile product managers to say, oh yeah, I would never release a product without docs. I've learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. Because when documentarians and technical writers say it, people see think that we're self-interested, right? Oh yeah, you just want to get paid. You just want to have a job. Well, yes, I do want to have a job, but I don't want to have a bullshit job where I make things of no value. That's terrible. Nobody wants that. Like, <laughs> so we need to like get more project managers and product managers to say, oh yeah, docs are essential. So Erin, uh, other than this you just mentioned, uh, uh, do you have a message you want to leave the listener with? Oh, I mean, just, I feel like everybody on this call, everybody listening to this podcast, like people who care about docs in the world, they, they understand the value of docs, but sometimes they're a little bit shy in sharing that <laughs> with other people. So don't, don't be shy, like toot your own horn, bang your own drum, share the research that's out there about how important documentation is. And don't feel like you're trying to like take away things from other parts of the org. This is, this is like a really good stew. Like a really good stew is better than a dish of potatoes, a dish of meat and a dish of carrots in three separate bowls, right? Something about bringing it all together makes it taste better. And adding documentation, making sure documentation is an integral part of what's being built makes everything better. And that's what I hope people advocate for. And sometimes I think people say, oh, well, it's going to sound like selfish if I'm just telling people, you know, give more money for docs. But no, it's an investment. It's you saying, hey, we need investment so that everything that we're working on can be more successful. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> Thank you all for having me here to rant at you. <laughs> Thank you. This is Thank really you. great. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. You can reach us at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apithedocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past presentations from the API conferences, as well as the upcoming programs.